Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Victor Emanuel Nature Tours webinar. I am Ben Reynolds, host and organizer of this webinar. Thank you for joining us today. We are delighted to offer this educational presentation about birds, nature, and vent tours. We hope you enjoy today's topic on raptor identification 101 with Eric Brunke. During this session, you may ask questions. However, questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. But if you have technical questions, let me know and I'll try to address them in real time. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on demand anytime at your convenience. A link to the recording will be delivered to you in an email tomorrow. Now back to our feature presentation. This presentation is delivered by Eric Brunke. He is a full-time vent tour leader. He leads tours in Texas, Colorado, Minnesota, Hawaii, Alaska, Panama, and Brazil. He has loved birds since he was a child looking at chickadees. In 2008, he graduated from Northland College in Wisconsin with a degree in natural resources. Between 2009 and 14, he spent his summers conducting field research focused on breeding bird transects in Upper Michigan, point counts for a breeding bird atlas in Minnesota and Wisconsin's Northlands, Northwoods, vegetation and breeding bird surveys throughout wind farms in North Dakota's prairie potholes and cavity nesting surveys in the Cascade Mountains of Oregon. A, do a devoted raptor nerd, he is drawn to hawk watches. He worked as an interpreter for six seasons at Hawk Ridge Bird Observatory in Duluth, Minnesota, counted migratory raptors at the Corpus Christi Hawk Watch in Texas in 2015, and in 2016, 17 and 18, hawk counter at the Cape May Hawk Watch in New Jersey. Eric's wildlife photography has won national awards, and he's written for the American Birding Association's Birders Guide, Bird Watching Magazine, and Bird Watchers Digest. When not leading birding tours, Eric often leads field trips and speaks at birding festivals. He also enjoys hiking, kayaking, cross-country skiing, and just being out in the snow. In his free time, he loves to cook and bake. We are thrilled to have Eric present about tips and tricks to study and identify raptors. Without further ado, I will turn the controls over to Eric. Thank you, Ben. All right. Um, again, thank you, Ben, for that for the introduction. Uh, sincere thank you to to Victor and the entire Vent team uh, for giving me this 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 honor of presenting this uh, this presentation this afternoon. I'm really delighted to to meet with all of you, and it really means so much to have all of you here today. Um, over the next hour, uh, I'm going to be talking about raptor identification. And one of the, the fun things about raptor identification is, you know, birds bring us together. Birds bring us together. And uh, in the world of raptors, there's, there's larger ones, smaller ones, there's rarer ones. Uh, some we see in our, in our own backyards, whereas others you have to go to like a hawk watch or to kind of great lengths in order to study them. And um, because of this mysteriousness of how raptors work um, in our lives of birding, uh, they can be hard to grasp as far as how to tell them apart. So my main goal over the next hour is to give you a sense of what makes each raptor that raptor. I really mean that. What makes each raptor that raptor? Uh, when you look in the field guides, uh, there's oftentimes many things to consider when looking at like a sharpshin hawk versus a cooper's hawk or, um, or considering differences both uh, subtle and may be very obvious to certain people. Um, from my, uh, my experience of hawk watching, I found it to be addictive. Uh, the, more, the more raptors I saw, the more I wanna do it. So it kind of builds on itself. And, um, and so, so throughout this presentation, uh, like I said, uh, we'll, we'll be delving into uh, many different subtleties of how to tell these birds apart. Uh, this right here is a juvenile sharp-shinned hawk, um, a, a amazingly beautiful raptor that's quite widespread, uh, especially in the winter months, 
And uh, this photo was taken uh, just, uh, just below the, the Cape May Hawk Watch. So going on with birds of prey, uh, there are many species of birds of prey worldwide. And the, the assortment of raptors that you see here uh, were all uh, witnessed over the past year in particular on bench tours that I was leading. The, uh, the bird in the upper left is a gray-headed kite. And um, all these birds really do have a story to them too, um, both innately as a species, but also from personal experiences. Uh, this gray-headed kite in particular, I'd like to share with all of you. Um, it was uh, my, uh, my fourth uh, trip that I was leading in Panama. And uh, we were um, out at this beautiful wooded road uh, while visiting the canopy camp. And uh, lo and behold, I got to see this gray-headed kite with the, with the group of vent clients. And it was amazing. Um, it actually brought me to tears in the moment. We saw this bird flying overhead, displaying its beautiful wing beats. And um, it was actually courting for another gray-headed kite in the area. So we saw it um, doing this, this elaborate display. And, and um, just this, this amazing, um, this, this amazing um, uh, courtship behavior that rarely people get to see. Um, in the top center is a peregrine falcon, which is a widespread bird of prey um, found, um, uh, found pretty much worldwide, actually. The, the peregrine falcon that you see here is a juvenile peregrine falcon. Uh, it has these beautiful golden scallops lining the, uh, the trailing edge of the wings, a very, very striking bird. Uh, with a beautiful black malar streak, which is the, the stripe going through the eye. In the upper right corner, you see a red-tailed hawk. And red-tailed hawks are one of my personal favorite birds. Um, I really mean it when I say, you know, to, to many avid birders too, you really can't pick one favorite bird. But I've always had a special place for red-tailed hawks in my heart. Um, they're, they're widespread. Uh, they're found from coast to coast, actually, throughout North America. and they're found in different color varieties. So some are, some are light, uh, some are dark. Uh, they have, um, have various appearances depending on the region that they're found in too, going beyond colors even. Um, really, really beautiful birds. Uh, this photograph in particular was taken in Wisconsin in midwinter. In the bottom left, we see a, an osprey uh, being chased by a bald eagle. And this is a pretty common occurrence along the East Coast, um, especially during migration, when both of these birds are coming through in good numbers. Uh, the bald eagle is on the left, a uh, massive raptor, absolutely massive, large wings, sizable tail, um, just a big, bulky appearance overall, whereas the ospreys um, can be a little more slender winged. We'll get into that in a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Um, but one of the things that drives bird migration, and this goes for raptors, goes for songbirds, uh, goes for the whole gamut of birds worldwide is food availability. And so when you're out hawk watching, uh, keep in mind that, you know, depending on the habitat that's around you, that might provide certain food to be available. Like in this case, um, being on the East Coast, there was this bunker or menhaden as it's called, uh, which was being carried away by the osprey, which in turn drew the bald eagle. In the bottom center, we have an aplomato falcon. Uh, this is another uh, personal favorite. I um, absolutely just fell in love with them. The very first time I saw them in South Texas. Uh, they're found in both southeastern Arizona as a rarity, uh, but more commonly, they actually breed through, uh, through South Texas as a year-round resident too. And then in the bottom right is a harpy eagle. Uh, this, this bird just radiates, um, it radiates fierceness and power. Uh, this is the national bird of Panama. Uh, so it's a real delight to see. Uh, it is found through South America and select areas of Central America. Uh, this photo in particular was taken um, from our canopy camp experience. So without further ado and going to the identification part of this talk, we'll be talking about different features of raptors. And there's different ways to look at birds of prey like I was describing. Um, a lot of people, when they're getting new into the world of hawk watching, they focus on field marks, or they focus on color, or they focus on size or shape. And um, there's different ways to look at raptors. I'll give all of you a moment to 
to appreciate this photo right here, uh, which I actually have intentionally desaturated uh, so you can focus on the on the profile of the bird and field marks rather than uh, looking at colors. So give it a little thought to what this bird may be. And in the next slide, the answer is more revealed from a color spectrum. Uh, this is a red-tailed hawk, an adult red-tailed hawk, in, in fact. Um, all red-tailed hawks, uh, regardless of the, the age or gender, will host uh, typically three main features on most of, most of the individuals found throughout the species range. And that is um, they can host a belly band, they can host a wrist comma, which is a small feathers that are lined up in a in kind of a crescent-like fashion near the wrist area of the wing. And they can hold a, a patagial mark as well, which is the shoulder area on the red-tailed hawk. So again, I'll go back one slide just for you to, to see these field marks. And um, noting that every raptor, not only from its, its shape, also has its own field marks. Okay, so now we have another red-tailed hawk from, an, from a side angle. And with a bird like this, notice what you see and notice what you don't see. Okay, notice what you see and notice what you don't see. Um, field marks are very important, but there's times when you're out looking at raptors when some of the more important field marks that we just talked about with red-tailed hawks, for example, might be hidden. Now, noting this bright red tail on the backside of this bird is a good feature, but it's not unique to red-tailed hawks. So a lot of raptor identification is, is stepping back for a moment, being in a zen-like fashion, and looking at the, the profile and the form of the bird. What makes that bird that bird? So there's a lot of things to consider with these various birds of prey. And one of the biggest things I'd like all of you to take home from this talk is to look at raptors from a different perspective. Like I just said to uh, take a step back and see how they move through the air, how they go from point A to point B and what they do as they go from point A to point B. Uh, these can be very important clues for identifying these, these birds of prey. Uh, here we have American kestrels soaring around the top of the Cape May lighthouse during uh, one of the peak American kestrel migration days from a few years ago. So size is relative when you're a bird of prey. Size is relative. Um, unless if you have another bird next to an initial bird of prey, it, it's nearly impossible to tell what you think of as size. A lot of times uh, from years of hawk counting, I've heard people come up to me and they'll, they'll say something like, oh, the bird looks so big, or oh, the bird looks so small. Well, when people say that, that's with the assumption that they know exactly how far the bird is, or maybe it might be flying in front of a tree that's, you know, a um, number of feet away from them. But when you see a bird like this far away, it's hard to tell size. Now, I can tell you that this is a northern harrier by silhouette. They're slender bellied, slender through the undertail covert, which is like the underside of the tail, long slender tail, and fairly slender wings, especially when the wings are fully extended. So, so they have this stout headed, long slender profiled form that's unique to Northern Harriers. I'll say it again, size is relative. Um, the, this, there's a peregrine falcon above and a merlin below. And uh, this was also uh, noted at the Cape May Hawk Watch a few years ago. This merlin happened to be taking a little stoop at the peregrine falcon. So just by by relative size alone from this picture, we can tell if the Merlin is smaller, the Peregrine is bigger because we have this as a point of reference. Now getting a little uh, higher soaring, we have broad-winged hawks. There's a picture kind of in the bottom left, if you will, of an adult broad-winged hawk soaring. They have very angular wings where the wings come out from the body, they taper up, to the wing tips, so straight out and then up to the wing tips on the broadwing hawks. A little higher up in the sky, you see a picture kind of in the bottom right of one fairly high up. And then come midday, this is a photo taken um, from the Corpus Christi Hawk Watch um, on one of our peak broadwing hawk days. And I can assure you that these are all broadwing hawks. 
So going on with, with relative size, it's also important to focus on shape. The falcon on the left is a peregrine falcon. So very, very slender profiled um, complexion as far as the, like, the, like, the, like the torso going through the tail, long slender profile, very aerodynamic. The wings are thick on the innermost part of the wing, but they're long and slender out through the wing tips or what I'll be referring to as the hands of the wing a little bit later on. On the right, we see a Northern Harrier. And Northern Harriers are the raptor of long slender proportions. So excluding size, just looking at proportions, when they're in a full soar, they have a long tail relative to their body and long slender wings relative to their body. One of the biggest disciplines for getting into hawk watching and pursuing it both um, on a professional level, but also for leisure, is being able to understand raptors in this different sense. And when you look at raptors, see if you can identify the bird in your head or if you can describe it in your head without talking about big or small. Like for example, the red-tailed hawk on the left has, has very elongated, massive wings, has a really, really wide spread and, and a mid-sized tail, but overall this bird takes up a lot of space in the sky relative to its body in addition to the wrist commas, patagial marks, and belly bands. On the right, you're gonna see a broad-winged hawk for comparison. Now keep in mind, the broad-winged hawk is smaller than the red-tailed hawk. But staying with the topic at hand, the broad-winged hawk is much shorter winged. Relative to the body, broad-winged hawks are short-winged. They're pointy-winged, and the tail is relatively short. Another way of looking at raptors is looking at how the wings are shaped. Are the wings deep like a bald eagle? Deep meaning from front to back, are they very heavy? Or is it slender and maybe slightly curved like an osprey? So wing profile is another very important clue when getting into raptors. Keeping it simple, looking at the structure and the shape of a raptor is more important when identifying raptors in flight than it is estimating how big or small a raptor looks. And here we have probably three of the most commonly confused raptor species in North America, without a doubt. Um, when considering excipitors, which these are, there's a sharp shin hawk below, Cooper's hawk above, and a northern goshawk on the right, it's important to look at, at the shape of the bird and the shape of the tail. On a sharp shin hawk, sharp shin hawks are tiny headed, stout winged, and very, very, uh, very slender tailed with a squared off end. Okay. Cooper's hawks, a little bit larger headed, straight winged, a little bit longer winged, and a longer rounded end to the tail. The goshawk. Northern goshawk on the far right is large headed. It's long winged, but it's very heavy winged from front to back. They're very thick winged. And also where the tail meets up with the body on the Northern goshawk, it's always very, very thick. So goshawk kind of radiate this heft or this boldness in flight. Whereas the Cooper's hawk and the Sharpshin hawks are a little more slender with their extremities. It's all how you look at it. And I'll say it again too, you can't rush raptor identification. Just take a step back and enjoy them as they fly around. We're talking about tail length. Uh, this is uh, my good friend, Arthur Nelson here in Cape May showing a Northern goshawk uh, that he, um, he, he successfully banded here in Cape May a few falls ago. You can see the dimensions on a Northern goshawk. It's a, it's a really sizable bird and everything about them once again, is heavy. It's a bold, heavy profiled raptor. Now, one of the features for telling northern goshawk versus sharp shin hawks and cooper's hawks is all northern goshawk have a very bold white supercilium, which is the eyebrow stripe. Cooper's hawks and sharp shin hawks rarely show that, but goshawk will always show that. 
going on to looking at better grasping a certain species, like a red-tailed hawk, for example, it's important to keep in mind that juvenile raptors can look different than adult raptors. And in nearly all birds of prey, juveniles are typically just slightly longer winged and slightly longer tailed than the adults. That'll change when they molt into their adult plumage in the years to come. But in general, uh, juveniles, knowing it's of the same species and the same gender, um, can typically have a slightly longer winged, longer tailed look than the adults. So we have a juvenile red-tailed hawk on the left. Note the belly band, the wrist commas, and the patagial marks, the very pale trailing edge of the wing. And on the right, we see a red-tailed hawk with a belly band, patagial mark, wrist comma, much much bolder, strike, more striking markings with that um, bright red tail, bold trailing edge to the wing. So ask yourself, when you're looking at raptors, what do you see? What do you see? Not what do you think you see, but what do you actually see through binoculars? Like in this case, this is a moment where two falcons were chasing each other. Um, the, the bird on the left is an American kestrel. The bird on the right is a merlin. We'll get to the idea of, of both of those in just a little bit. So American kestrels are, are very pale below. Okay? They have a mask of white and black. They have light streaks below and very, very pale underbelly. Even the tail overall is quite pale, as are the underwings. This also adds to their transparent complexion to their wings. Merlin are very, very dark winged. They're also very sharply pointed at the ends of their wing. They have dark vertical streaks running along their belly and really, really dark bands going through their tail. So looking at these two in conclusion, uh, Merlins overall are darker, more angular looking, sharper edged appearance, whereas American kestrels are paler, a little bit more rounded look overall. Here's a picture of an American kestrel on the left with a Merlin on the right. American kestrel once again, overall the wings are relatively pale or not black, I guess you could say, and the tail is kind of rufous with faint black bands going throughout them. If you take a, a few inches back from the monitor or your, or your screen where you're viewing, you'll see that the kestrel overall is paler. The merlin, on the other hand, regardless of angles, the merlin will appear darker, with darker streaks through the underbelly, darker wings, a darker helmet or a head, and much darker tail. Wing beats can be another very important clue for telling different birds of prey apart. The American kestrel has very unique wing beats, and I'm going to share something with all of you that um, I don't know if this has ever made the books or not, um, but a little thing I made up about 10 years ago when I was at Hawk Ridge is I was seeing a lot of these kestrels flying by, and I realized that the wing beats were very floppy, kind of slappy. Uh, similar to a banana peel. So what I like to tell people is if you see a small pale falcon flying by with banana peel-like wing beats, you are looking at an American kestrel. American kestrels, the falcon with banana peel wing beats, okay? Merlin, on the other hand, are very swift flyers, okay? So very pointy-winged, they're oftentimes hurried, and they fly like they're late for a date. So Merlin are very, very fast flapping. Their, their, uh, their motion through the air too. Merlins uh, tend to be very direct. From point A to point B, they're on a mission, very streamlined. Kestrels can sometimes be like that, but in migration, they also meander around a fair amount too, which kind of adds to their banana peel-like wing beat. When looking at larger birds like northern harriers, uh, Northern Harriers, a little thing I made up about Harriers a while back, is that this is the one raptor that appears to bounce basketballs with the wingtips. So what I mean by that is, if you were to imagine a Northern Harrier playing basketball, and with every wing beat, it would, it would flap down with a hurried motion, bring the wings up slow, 
slap down with the hurried motion, bring the wings up slow. This cadence of fast down, slow with the upbeat is a good feature to look for with Northern Harrier. That is unique to them. Also on this Northern Harrier with its long wings and long tail, you can see the white rump patch. And this feature is found on every Northern Harrier, regardless of age or gender. Another clue for looking at raptors is noting how the wings are held in a soar. So let's go beyond how the birds flap, okay? And let's go beyond the, the, the shape of the bird altogether. But let's look at kind of the, the gestalt of backing up and looking at the appearance of the shape of the wings. Like bald eagles, for example, look like a flying two by four. When they're in a full soar, the wings are nearly perfectly level or straight across, like a big plank of wood. You can see this on this photo of the bald eagle flying over Cape May. Other little feature to mention about bald eagles is if you ever see a large dark winged bird soaring overhead with a plank of wood like wings, lacking a head and tail altogether against bright white clouds, that's gonna be an adult bald eagle. The white head and tail disappear against bright white backgrounds. Next we have a golden eagle. Golden eagles are similar to bald eagles they're, um, they're, they're structured a little differently, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, but the wings, the wings are ever so slightly upturned on a golden eagle. When, when uh, these, these uh, eagles are flapping, bald eagles with their powerful rowing wing beats always end on the down beat. So they flap, the very last flap when coming to a soar, they end on the down beat. Golden eagles typically end on the up beat, bringing their wings up slightly and holding them just slightly above horizontal giving them a very fluid motion with their wing beats. And then we have turkey vultures, the very beautiful turkey vultures. Uh, the turkey vultures have what's called a dihedral, very pronounced V-shape in the wings. Uh, regardless if it's a calm day or a windy day, uh, turkey vultures are known for this behavior of having this dihedral profile. We also have birds like osprey. These osprey, have drooped wings. So they're they're arched in the middle or kind of raised in the elbows, and they have drooped hands. So this is another feature uh, to look for specifically for osprey. So a lot of raptor identification is looking at how the bird is shaped without looking at field marks, how the bird is shaped. Now, even with turkey vultures, we just covered turkey vulture a moment ago. Um, on the right, you can see a turkey vulture in full soar. To the left is its cousin, a black vulture. And black vultures are shorter winged and relatively level winged. Here's a photo from the Corpus Christi Hawk Watch. You can see on the left, the turkey vulture with the red head, the very two-toned wings with the dihedral is showing its full form of what makes a turkey vulture a turkey vulture. Now on the right is a pretty uncommon site that hangs out with turkey vultures periodically, uh, especially in the Southwest and, and deep South. This is a zone-tailed hawk. And zone-tailed hawks, and some people call them turkey vulture wannabes, and they're, they're, um, they're a really neat bird of prey. They're actually more closely related to red-tailed hawks and the rest of the budios than they are turkey vultures. But they look a lot like turkey vultures with that two-toned underwing, the dihedral in their wing. A little factoid about them is that when they are hanging out with turkey vultures, unlike the turkey vultures that are exclusive scavengers, these zone-tailed hawks will actually uh, go after live prey. So they're kind of like an undercover raptor um, hiding among the, the scavengers, but eventually going for live prey. So one of the things about hawk watching is you will see birds at a distance and you may see birds up close. And one of the, the trained senses of watching raptors is looking at how birds appear to you or noting how birds appear to you from a distance. Like here we have a male Northern Harrier, also known as a gray ghost because of the silvery gray wing complexion. And Northern Harriers, when they're in a full glide like this, they crook back their wings, they're very, very sleek, angular winged. 
They're still very long-tailed. And note, note the white rump on this northern harrier. So notice what you see, notice what you don't see. And here's a closer view at a different northern harrier. So notice what you see and notice what you don't see. Also consider the habitat. In the previous picture, this northern harrier is flying among a marsh. In this current picture, this northern harrier is also flying in front of a marsh, some wetland habitat. Northern harriers used to be called marsh hawks. So looking at habitat, like with all bird watching, can be a clue for telling these different birds apart. So we've talked a little bit about different features to look for when telling birds of prey apart. And this is a presentation that um, in, all, in all reality, it could take hours to go through, um, go through the gamut of all the different genuses of raptors found in, in North America, for example. Um, but what I've focused on specifically are the raptors that are found throughout Canada and the entire US, uh, keeping it a uh, focus on how our domestic tours work, okay? Uh, so um, for the, uh, for the uh, duration of this presentation, we'll be talking about the eagles, the vultures, the kites, the osprey, the harrier, accipiters, the budios, and the falcons, like this juvenile peregrine falcon off to the right. So here's two eagles side by side. And on the left is an adult bald eagle. Now looking at the shape of the wings, the wings are long. They're long, they're deep all the way through the ends, and the trailing edge or the hind edge of the wing is relatively straight, all things considered, relatively straight. A little bit of a bowed motion to it, but it's not greatly curved. Now if you look at the, the trailing edge or the rear edge of the golden eagle's wing, Note the curvature where it, it, it curves in the secondaries or curves in the inner half of the wing and tapers into the body, okay? So this is a good feature to look for for golden eagles versus bald eagles. Another feature about uh, comparing bald eagle versus golden eagle is the head and the tail uh, extensions. So bald eagles are kind of a medium headed, medium tailed eagle. A golden eagle has the proportions as if you took a bald eagle's head and tail and pulled it through the body a little bit towards the backside of the bird. You would see a little more tail and a little less head. So smaller headed, longer kind of wedge shaped tail than a golden eagle, that's good for this species. So bald eagle on the left, golden eagle on the right. Next we'll talk about vultures. Uh, turkey vulture is on the left as labeled, black vulture is on the right. Turkey vultures have very two-toned wings. They lead with the dark edge, the trailing edge is very pale. Um, don't judge a turkey vulture by the color of its head um, because the adults have, have red heads. Uh, the juveniles actually have dark heads, so you can't always identify them by the color of the head. But look at the, look at the profile of the wings, upturned wings, very two-tone through the length. It's a good feature to go for with the turkey vultures. The black vulture is shown on the right. Black vultures, in comparison to turkey vultures, are very short-tailed and short-winged. So they're a much smaller vulture species overall. They will always have dark gray heads. They're also quite, I call it quite fancy, and I think they know it too. They have the pale jazz hands on a turkey vulture. Uh, sorry, on a black vulture. So when you're looking at a black vulture, look for the pale jazz hands among black wings. Good feature to look for. Turkey vultures are two-toned through the length of the wings. And sometimes, depending on where you are throughout the world, uh, you may see additional vulture species. Uh, when we're visiting the canopy camp in particular, in uh, eastern Panama, uh, we've had some exceptional days of, of wonderful birds of all sorts, um, and especially with raptors too, including several days over recent years of four vultures in one day. So we have the turkey vulture in the upper left, 
black vulture in the upper right, king vulture in the bottom left, and a lesser yellow-headed vulture in the bottom right. So it's it's always fun to you know maximize the the various birds which we're seeing, uh, and especially to get the vulture swoop is kind of a fun treat by itself. Next, we'll go to the kites, the different kite species found uh, throughout the U.S. Um, there's four main species of kite which are found here uh, regionally, as far as the world goes. Uh, Swallow-tailed kites are from the southeastern U.S., and they are a magnificent raptor. Uh, it doesn't matter if you've seen them before or if it is a lifer. Um, I guarantee you that you know when you're in the presence of a swallow-tailed kite, witnessing and savoring how they flap, their wing beats are fluidity and gracefulness to a T, and it almost makes you cry, I really mean that. They are just the essence of fluidness for how they move through the air. They also have deeply forked tails. So you can see from this photo, they're a very elegant looking raptor. In the upper right, we have a white-tailed kite. White-tailed kites are white-headed, uh, very white below, white-tailed with this juvenile, or th this, this adult and um, uh, very, very striking wings as well. Uh, they're found in the western states as well as the, the, uh, the arid southwest. So really, really beautiful um, white-tailed kite. Next, we'll talk about the Mississippi kite. Mississippi kites are, are a widespread raptor that's actually increasingly uh, found north as the years progress, likely due to climate change. Uh, the Mississippi kites, they're very angular wings, so relatively straight, um, straight trailing edge of the wing, extra long tapered hands or tapered tips of the wings, and very dark complexion overall. The, this is an adult shown, very, very smoky gray throughout the body. Juveniles get kind of vertical rusty streaks through their underbelly. And the bottom right is a hook-billed kite, and this is one of them that is is uh is quite a rarity for the u.s but when they do show up they they've been known to show up in deep south texas uh so this is always one of the birds that we look for on a rio grande valley tour and i've had a uh, success actually over recent years of seeing this this beautiful bird uh they used to be more widespread throughout deep south texas um, but due to deforestation um, they're still present but but only as a rarity Next, we'll talk about osprey. So there is there is one species of osprey uh, in in North America, and osprey are incredible birds. They're they're kind of a uh, they're a bird of vast waterways. So large wings help them soar over these large waterways. Uh, from a distance, they actually look like an oversized gull with hunched shoulders, drooped hands, like I talked about before. Uh, this is a juvenile osprey, uh, noting the golden freckles along the back side of the wing and a very slight amount of blush on the front of the bird as well. You can see the fish that this, this osprey is carrying. This is menhaden, uh, one of the local fish in this, this area of Cape May that osprey really go crazy for, especially in migration. Another neat feature to share with all of you about osprey is they always carry fish head first. They always carry fish head first, and this is done for aerodynamic reasons. And all osprey, regardless of age, will always show a dark stripe going through their eye. This patch of dark feathers reduces glare since they spend their entire lives among water. Uh, next, we'll get to the harriers. Uh, North America has one species of harrier, that's the northern harrier, and they are an incredible bird, absolutely incredible. Uh, this is a juvenile northern harrier, very, very rich, rusty coloration throughout the underside. Um, uh, the adults, like we talked about, are called gray ghosts, very smoky gray throughout the backside. And they're found around marshes. So use habitat as the clue when looking for northern harriers. Very, very low flying, bounding over, over low fields and over marshes. Next, we'll talk about Budios, a very widespread genus of birds. In the upper left, we have broad-winged hawks, a very numerous bird of prey, sometimes found in residential areas, but especially found in like parklands and vast forests of uh, eastern U.S. and throughout Canada. And this is a, a, an adult 
broadwing hawk. It has bold black and white bands in the tail and a very angular wing profile like I talked about. So the wings, they come straight out from the sides of the body. Look at the trailing edge of the wing. It comes straight out from the sides of the body and it tapers up to the tip. This is an adult because it has um, a brown headed look with horizontal bars of brown going throughout the front. Juveniles have a lighter trailing edge of the wing and have light vertical streaks through their underbelly. In the upper right is a short-tailed hawk, a really gorgeous raptor uh, that's found primarily in Florida, but does also occur in deep south Texas as a rarity from time to time. Uh, short-tailed hawks occur as light morphs and dark morphs, as do broad-winged hawks. With the red-shouldered hawk in the bottom left, this is an adult red-shouldered hawk. Beautiful rusty complexion through the underside. Um, uh, various uh, red-shouldered hawks in different regions can also be kind of a frostier gray color, a very, very off red color. So the species is quite widespread and does vary regionally. Uh, but one of the features to look for with red-shouldered hawks is that regardless of age or gender, red-shouldered hawks will always have very pale crescents near the outer parts of the wings. So even on a semi-sunny day or a slightly cloudy day, um, that, that light panel in the wing can be a good clue for telling these species apart or for telling a red-shouldered hawk. Um, and the bottom right is a gray hawk, um, an absolutely incredible, uh, pretty small bird of prey that's found in two regions throughout the U.S. Uh, they occur as a rarity in southeastern Arizona, but where they're more widespread actually is in deep south Texas, where they actually breed and are year-round residents. So gray hawk, very, very special bird. Beautiful, extra fine brown uh, or uh, gray vermiculations throughout the underbelly on the adults. Very bold, separated vertical streaks of brown on the juveniles. Next, we'll get to um, additional budios. We have a Swainson's hawk in the upper left. This is an adult showing a very two-toned underwing. Leads with the pale edge, trailing edge is dark, and a hood and helmet of brown and gray. Very, very striking bird. These Swainson's hawks fly thousands of miles every year to Western South America. They, they experience this mass migration from the western half of the U.S. to the western tier of, of South America. Ferruginous hawk is found in the upper right corner. Uh, the bird's name comes from ferrous, meaning iron, and they have very rusty colored legs, very deep red legged appearance. Um, so uh, ferruginous hawk, what I like to tell people about ferruginous hawks is if you had a budio that was trying so hard to morph into the profile of an eagle, you're probably looking at a ferruginous hawk. They are massive winged, absolutely enormous winged, long winged and deep winged. Uh, next in the bottom left, we have red-tailed hawk. Like I said before, red-tailed hawks are, are quite varied from east coast to west coast. They come in different color varieties. This is an adult red-tailed hawk, noting the bold red tail. There's even some red-tailed hawks found um, up in Alaska, for example, called the Harlan's red-tailed hawk. And we get some wonderful views of those on our June Alaska tours when we're going through, uh, through Nome in particular. It's a great spot to study them. And in the bottom right is rough-legged hawk, another species that comes from the Arctic tundra. So way up north, like up in Alaska, northern Canada is where they breed. And then they'll spend their winters in some of the northern limits of the U.S., um, occasionally going uh, farther south depending on eruption year or not. But basically, this is a bird that's incredibly fluffy and well insulated and is built for the cold. On these rough-legged hawks, uh, regardless of age or gender, look for the black carpal patches in the wings. A really bold black spot. Uh, carpal means wrist. So look for the black carpal or the wrist patches in the wing on the rough-legged hawks. On the left, we have a Harris's hawk. Harris's hawks are found from the air, or found throughout the arid Southwest. They're a pretty sizable budio that's also used in falconry because of their intelligence. Uh, they will actually hunt together as family groups. 
uh, ambushing snakes sometimes, running from behind rocks. Uh, they're, they're, they operate on a different IQ, I feel, than, than, than a lot of birds do. Uh, it's really neat to watch them in action. Um, this is a juvenile um, being vertically streaked down the front, very broad paddle-shaped wings, and a very long tail for a, for a bootio. Sometimes referred to as a para bootio, as a para bootio because of their, their specific design and how they're a little different than some of the other bootios. On the right, we see a common black hawk. Common black hawks are another uh, beautiful raptor of, of the western, western mountainous, more arid areas. Uh, thanks to uh, fellow vent leader Brian Gibbons for sharing this picture. Beautiful photo of an adult. A white-tailed hawk is, is on the left. Uh, this is an adult white-tailed hawk. Really striking gray hood, bold white below, a little bit like a Swainson's hawk, but they have more of a more of an elegant curviness throughout the wing. They have um, more of a blending of, of pale to dark throughout the wing as well. And like the name says, uh, the tail is mostly white on an adult white-tailed hawk. The juvenile white-tailed hawks are incredibly striking. They, um, uh, they can have varying degrees of rusty modeling throughout their underwing. Very, very beautiful. Uh, this is a species that's found primarily up the Texas coast, um, but is more commonly found in more tropical areas, tropical areas of the world. Um, and on the far right, we have a zone-tailed hawk, which again is like that turkey vulture look-alike. Absolutely incredible sight. Uh, this photo in particular was taken on our Lower Rio Grande Valley tour in South Texas. So quite a magnificent bird. Note the yellow feet and the yellow beak. Those are features that you will not see on a turkey vulture. Oh, and another uh, favorite bird is the eo, pronounced eo, or Hawaiian hawk. Uh, this, this petite bootio is actually a cousin of the short-tailed hawk. Uh, we get to see this this raptor with with fair numbers actually um, on our Hawaii tour. It's not found uh, throughout the earlier islands, but as soon as we get to the Big Island of Hawaii, uh, this this species is quite widespread and, and quite a treat to see. So we have a dark morph EO on the left, adult um, uh, light morph, or sorry, a, a, a light morph EO on the right. So we talked about the bootios, which are like the, which are the birds of prey that do a lot of soaring. Next, we'll get to falcons. And falcons in general are very sleek. They're sleek, they're angular wing, they're built for speed. Uh, we have an American kestrel in the upper left. Remember, very pale bellied below with the banana peel wing beats. We'll go to the bottom left, continuing on actually covering them, the merlin. Merlins are very pointy winged, very dark tailed. This is the bird that flaps like it's late for a date. Okay, American kestrels, pale, sloppy winged like a banana. Merlins fly like they're late for a date, very dark. Crested caracara is in the upper right. And crested caracaras are another bird of the arid southwest and, uh, and through the tropics. They're, they're an incredible species. They're, they're one of the more unique looking falcons as far as falcons go in, in North America. They're long-legged, large build, and the wings are actually quite broad, all things considered. A uh, good feature to look for them is this black cap on top of their head, long pale tail, and very pale hands through the ends of the wings. Aplomato falcon is featured in the bottom left, or sorry, bottom right. Uh, this is um, a species that um, is a rare stray into Arizona, but is actually expected in South Texas as a breeding bird. So they've, they've actually been increasing up the Texas coast. Um, absolutely amazing bird. Pale, uh, pale buffy underparts, uh, dark belly band, gr uh, white breast, absolutely striking complexion. And we have our falcons continuing on, our larger falcons. Peregrine falcon is, is the bird in the top center. So peregrine falcons, when you're looking at falcons, once again, think pointed wings, long tail. Okay? Peregrine falcons just scream the essence of, of angular proportions. So very sleek, um, uh, flared back wings in a stoop, and when they're gliding after prey. Uh, this is a juvenile peregrine falcon. Noticing the vertical streaks down the front. 
and um, also noticing that its its eye ring and sear, like the base of the beak, is is blue, not yellow like on the adults. In the bottom left, we have a prairie falcon. Prairie falcons are are uh, are a sizable falcon of the western states where the prairies meet with the cliffs. Okay, they 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 love vast expanses of the western states. And with the prairie falcon, note the dark underwings, that two-toned underwing, dark leading edge of the wing with the with a slightly paler trailing edge of the wing. That's a good feature to look for with prairie falcon. Next, we'll go on to jeer falcon in the bottom right. Uh, this was a photo taken last June on the um, uh, the, uh, the the Nome Alaska tour. And uh, jeer falcons are the largest falcons in the world. So they are pointy winged and long tailed like the other falcons are, but everything about them is even more massive. They're thick headed, thick winged. Um, they're, they're, they're very heavy in all proportions. And they don't have nearly as much of a malar streak or a, a mustache dark stripe going through the eye as the peregrine falcons do. And you can see that comparison right here. A little bit duskier faced overall. Uh, next, we'll get to excipiters. Excipiters mean a true hawk or some people call them hawks of the woods. So what you see right here are three excipiters placed together. And this is a feature that you rarely, or that anyone really uh, rarely gets to see. And a lot of it has to do with the habitat and location. Uh, so I, I first and foremost want to do a shout out to, um, to Frank Nicoletti, a good friend um, from years past and um, and his counting and banding efforts at Hawk Ridge Bird Observatory in Duluth, Minnesota, uh, from where this photo was taken. Um, it's this premier hawk watch um, that draws uh, thousands of raptors every fall um, to, to uh, the Duluth, Minnesota area. And it also happens to be the largest concentration of goshawk in the world. So if you're looking to see Northern goshawk, I recommend a visit to Hawk Ridge Bird Observatory, especially during the month of October, can be a very good time to see northern goshawk. So on the left, we have a juvenile northern goshawk, big, fierce exhibitor. There's a Cooper's hawk in the middle, the middle-sized exhibitor species. Now this is an adult with a dark cap, red eye, mottled barring through the front. And then on the far right, we have the very petite and diminutive sharp shin hawk. So squared off tail. Very, very compact profile on the sharp shin hawk. Next, we'll go into um, excipiter identification. Uh, since excipiters consistently are some of the greater challenges uh, for, for a lot of people, uh, sharp shin hawks. When sharp shin hawks are soaring, you're going to note that their, their point A to point B motions in the air are are relatively indirect. They, they, they do a lot of swirling, lots of circling, and their circles are, are quite small or quite compact. Birds with smaller wings are gonna make smaller circles in the air. Birds with large broad wings are gonna make larger circles in the air when they soar. So looking at how they move through the air can be a clue. With sharp shin hawks, it's also important to keep in mind that they are the smallest of the exhibitor species. So one of the rules of thumb that can be applied to every raptor and pretty much every fly, flying bird of the world um, is the larger the bird, larger wing the bird is, the slower they flap. The smaller the, the, the wings are on a bird, the faster they flap. So sharp shin hawks are known for a very, very fast burst of flap, 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 glide, flap, 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 glide, really uh, fast bursts of flapping, gliding motion, making small circles in the air. They're small headed, and they're, they're, they, you can see the tail, but the tail is not extremely long relative to the body. Tail's also squared off, okay? So we're looking at a bird that's basically, it's compact, and what you see is mostly wings on a sharp shin hawk, okay? So here's some photos of, of a sharp shin hawk, or of, of various sharp shin hawks as they were circling around. So from a partial head-on view, from a side angle, notice what you see, and notice what you don't see and ignore size because you can't tell size. You cannot tell size from these photos alone, but you can tell the profile of the bird. So regardless of the angle, these birds show a squared off tail, 
It's mostly wings on a little body and a very compact head. Okay. Next, we'll go to Cooper's hawks. Cooper's hawks are quite widespread. Uh, if, if, you, um, if you feed some of the birds in your backyard, you may experience an accipiter from time to time. Uh, and especially if, if you are in more residential areas, uh, Cooper's hawks have an affinity for those areas because the habitat suits them. And uh, you may be experiencing Cooper's hawks uh, visiting your feeders, but not necessarily for the bird seed. So with the Cooper's hawks, if you do see a Cooper's hawk flying over your yard or maybe flying by a hawk watch, what you'll note is that Cooper's hawks have a more prominent head. The head sticks out beyond the shoulders. They also have very, very faint streaks going through the front or the underbelly. Looks like little teardrops of brown. The tail is also very long and tapered. So if you see an accipiter with faint streaks on the front, longer, more slender wings, very proportionally long tail with a rounded end, it's likely going to be a Cooper's hawk. This is the accipiter of long, slender proportions. Another feature to go on about this photo in particular is the head. The head is, is, is a warm, rusty color on Cooper's hawks. So here's the Cooper's hawks in flight, adult in the upper right. Notice how they appear. The wings stream well off the body, and the tail is long, long, slender proportions, large head. Next, we'll talk about northern goshawk. Northern goshawk, these are typically quite elusive, but again, if you visit places like Hawk Ridge or some of the other more boreal uh, forest areas, you may get a chance to see them. So northern goshawks, um, oh, and they're also found in some of the western mountains as well, higher elevation areas. So with northern goshawks, uh, adults are on the left, juveniles are on the right. But, but remember, all northern goshawks have that bold white supercilium that goes through their eye. They are massive winged, regardless of the angles or the directions. It's a, it's a barrel-chested bird with the big head, a thick connecting point where the tail meets up with the body. Everything about him is heavy and dense on a northern goshawk. And a cool little pointer to share with all of you too, if you notice on both, both of the two left pictures, they have faint streaks in the undertail coverts. That's the underside of the tail. Sharpshin hawks and Cooper's hawks have bold white undertail coverts, never showing little streaks in the undertail. So, as we get towards the end, can you identify this bird? And remember, don't worry about size. Don't worry about size. Size can only go against learning raptors. Look at the proportions, and I'll walk you through with this, okay? So, this is a Budio. Remember, large wing soaring raptor. It's a Budio. It's got a little bit of a belly band. Tail sticks off a little bit, but it's mostly wings. It's a Budio that's mostly wings, long, expansive wings with the belly band and notice the wrist comma and notice the patagial mark. We've got a juvenile red-tailed hawk, everyone. Um, I do, I'd like to do a special shout out to, um, um, to uh, folks at Cornell Lab of, of Ornithology as well as Hawkwatch International for developing a Raptor ID app. Um, if you're looking to learn more about raptors, um, on your own, um, I highly recommend the Raptor ID app. Uh, it is available for both Android and Apple, um, and it's, it's an amazing app. It, uh, they actually used to have a charge for it, but it is now free. And um, a special thanks uh, to um, um, birding expert Brian Sullivan and a very dear friend and a personal mentor and inspiration, Jerry Ligori, who helped um, make this app happen. Um, it has um, video. Um, that's narrated uh, by Jerry Ligori. Um, it has many photos and much text as well. So I highly recommend the Raptor ID app if you're looking at learning more about this. Um, here's a, a truly on every vent tour, um, there are going to be opportunities, you know, for studying the wide gamut of nature and uh, and with uh, with birds of prey. 
Um, but um, before this presentation, I was going through the tours that Bent offers, and I picked out a few in particular that if you are looking at uh, at experiencing um, some of um, some of raptors in their prime in in either unusually good diversity or exceptionally big numbers, uh, these are some tours to consider, like Southern Arizona, um, Southern California. Um, next year, Will, Willie Hutchinson and I will be leading the Texas Rio Grande Valley tour together. Um, and um, Panama and Brazil are also exceptional for, um, for raptor watching. Uh, shown in the bottom left is uh, my very dear friend, uh, Carlos Bethencourt uh, from Panama, um, who is a long going leader at the, uh, the Canopy Lodge, Canopy Tower, um, and the Canopy Camp. And um, this is um, our, our beaming smiles after we had, had uh, located and savored um, views of a harpy eagle. So just just incredible. Uh, everyone's hearts were just just teeming with 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 uh, thrills. And um, in the upper right is a younger uh, white-tailed hawk from Texas. So does anyone have any questions? Well, thank you for that presentation, Eric. That was wonderful. And we'll let questions come in. Um, and as they're coming in, I'd like to announce uh, our next webinar, which will be September the 17th. Are you, there we go, by uh, Rick Wright, a scant generation after the fall of the wall, Berlin is once again one of the world's great cities, full of art, music, and history. But this thriving metropolis is also one of the world's greenest, with no fewer than 43 nature reserves inside its limits, its rich breeding avifauna and abundant migrants reveal a unique combination of Eastern and Western influences, piquantly recalling this compact region's fascinating history. Join Rick Wright to find out more about how our vent tours in spring or fall can help you experience the riches, natural and cultural, of one of Europe's most intriguing landscapes. And now we'll have a few questions and we are running into our, um, our hour mark. And so we'll answer two questions now. And then for all follow-up questions, uh, please email me, ben at ventbird.com and we'll pass them along to Eric and, uh, and we'll get the correct answers to you as best that we can. One of the questions, um, that we have here is, you know, a lot of, uh, in regards to the presentation, you have a lot of still photos where we have a lot of time of looking at uh, the raptors, but somebody wants, they ask, what are the key components of seeing a raptor quick in flight? Oh, um, if you happen to have a camera with you, and this is definitely a, a whole concept that takes six, some practice in the field. Um, if you're able to get some photos of the birds in flight, that's wonderful for studying the, the still moments that have been in front of you. Um, but I would say as, as far as, as getting on birds in flight um, and studying from, from those moments, single best thing is, is to, to lock onto the bird with your binoculars and kind of create your own, your own um, panned vision following the bird. It does take a lot of practice. And then um, our final question just for, for today is where do the ospreys go uh, during the winter? Can you talk about their migration pattern? Yeah, so, uh, so osprey, um, they, they leave the far north and uh, they leave the Great Lakes. They, they leave here in Cape May actually too. And um, osprey are gonna be going uh, into the, the the deep south states, and uh, especially like Gulf of Mexico is a massive uh, congregating area for osprey. Um, they're um, uh, from spending a, a few winters down in in South Texas. It's it's incredible to see uh, so many osprey that overwinter there. Like their numbers just explode along the coast uh, during the winter time, uh, where there's a lot of fish that are available. And once uh, late winter into spring comes around those birds will start heading north again. But yeah, to, to answer your question, um, like Florida, uh, lower lower coast, um, and then the Gulf of Mexico are, are major areas for uh, for wintering osprey. 
Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for your presentation and thank you everybody for joining us. We look forward uh, to having you at our next webinar. Have a good day, everybody. Bye.